Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our evening service. And again, uh, we're sorry that you are unable to gather here this evening. Unfortunately, due to our plumbing, there's not much we can do about that. But we are glad that you've gathered at least online. And it feels like going back to the, the bad old days, but at least we we're able to uh, live stream uh, the, the service to you. And we trust that uh, as you hear God's word and as you interact with what God is saying to you, that God will speak to you and you will respond in a way that would be appropriate. Uh, we're going to have a Bible reading and that Bible reading is going to be brought uh, by Tom. Good evening. Uh, the Bible reading comes from 1 Samuel chapter 26. The Ziphites went to Saul at Gibeah and said, Is not David hiding on the hill? at Hakalah, which faces Jeshimon. So Saul went down to the desert of Ziph with his 3,000 chosen men of Israel to search there for David. Saul made his camp beside the road on the hill of Hakalah, facing Jeshimon, but David stayed in the desert. When he saw that Saul had followed him there, he sent out scouts and learned that Saul had definitely arrived. Then David set out and went to the place where Saul had camped. He saw where Saul and Abner, son of Ner, the commander of the army, had lain down. Saul was lying inside the camp with the army encamped around him. David then asked Am Amalek, the Hittite, and Abishai, son of Zer Zeriah, Job's brother, who will go down into the camp with me to Saul. I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night. And there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground with one thrust of my spear. I won't strike him twice. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as the Lord lives, he says. The Lord himself will strike him. Either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But the Lord forbid that I should lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. Now get the spear and water jug that are near his head and let's go. So David took the spear and water jug near Saul's head and they left. No one saw or knew about it, nor did anyone wake up. They were all sleeping because the Lord had put them into a deep sleep. Then David crossed over to the other side and stood on top of the hill some distance away. There was a wide space between them. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner, Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you who calls to the king? David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? Why didn't you guard your lord the king? Someone came to destroy your lord the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as the Lord lives, you and your men deserve to die, because you did not guard your master, the Lord's anointed. Look around you. Where are the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord, the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done and what, what wrong am I guilty of? Now let, the Lord, let my Lord listen to his servant's words. If the Lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If, however, men have done it, may they be cursed before the Lord. They have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance and have said, Go, serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of the Lord. The King of Israel has come out to look for a flea, as one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Then Saul says, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you have considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I have acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Here is the king's spear, David answered. Let one of your young men come over and get it. The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and faithfulness. The Lord delivered you into my hands today, but I would not lay a hand on the Lord's anointed. As surely as I valued your life today, so may the Lord value my life and deliver me from all trouble. 
Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. This is the word of the Lord. Won't you join with me as we pray? Our Father, we are so grateful for all that you have done and the way in which you have revealed yourself to us. As we spend some time reflecting on the story of David and Saul and how you worked in quite a miraculous way, we pray that you would help us to discover through the power of the Spirit its relevance for us. And we pray that we would leave here and we would leave this evening, wherever we are, whatever homes we are in, encouraged to know that you are God who is constantly with us, who watches over us, and the God who strengthens us in our walk with you. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help us also to see something of the beauty of Christ, for Jesus' sake. Amen. Audacity is usually exciting and successful audacity, especially exciting. In the closing hours of the Battle of Perryville, in the war between uh, the two states in America, the Confederate General Leonidas Polk found himself in a nasty predicament. A body of troops had fired on his men. Polk was sure they were fellow Confederates and rode round to them, ordering the colonel in charge to cease firing at once. When Polk asked the colonel to identify himself, he did so, indicating that he was a commander of an Indiana regiment. Polk had misidentified these troops and now was face to face with a federal officer who demanded that Polk also identify himself. The twilight and the fact that Polk wore a dark cape probably kept him from being easily identified. Polk quickly decided on a bluff, riding right up to the federal colonel, shaking his fist in his face and exclaiming, I'll show you who I am, sir. Cease firing at once. He turned his horse and trotted down, slowly down the federal line, shouting to the troops to lower their guns. He dare not give the gag away by making a run for it, so he kept up his slow pace until he reached a thicket of trees and reasonable safety. When he arrived behind his own lines, he told his men, I've reconnoitred these fellows pretty closely, and I find there is mo no mistake who they are. You may get up and go and, and get them. And what an incredible act of audaciousness that the opposing general, opposing forces is able to get away with something like that. In David's situation, it's a little bit different, but just as audacious. Here is the man who has chased him all over the place. And here is David who finds an opportunity to go to Saul and his army who are camped there and take a risk in going into the very midst of that situation. And yet, and yet, God is overseeing the situation and God is uh, watching over David and God is ultimately expressing, uh, rather, uh, protecting David. And what we see here is against all odds, with an army against him, two men go into the very midst of the camp of Saul who is seeking to kill David. It is an incredible act of faith. And when we look at the life of David, what we see is we see a man who demonstrates at times, not always, but at times, demonstrates incredible faith. And this is one of those episodes. Faith expresses itself in a number of different ways as David shows us in this episode of four, uh, with Saul. Number one, faith requires patience. Or oh, if only we could learn patience in faith. Look at verses 6 to 12. David then asked Ahimelech, the Hittite, and Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, 
Joab's brother, who will go down to the camp with me to Saul? I'll go with you, said Abishai. So David and Abishai went to the army by night, and there was Saul lying asleep inside the camp with his spear stuck in the ground near his head. Abner and the soldiers were lying around him. Abishai said to David, Today God has delivered your enemy into your hands. Now let me pin him to the ground. With one thrust of my spear, I will strike him twice. Now listen to what David does. But David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him. Who can lay a hand on the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? As surely as Yahweh lives, he said, Yahweh himself will strike him either this time, uh, either his time will come and he will die, or he will go into battle and perish. But Yahweh forbid that I should lay a hand on Yahweh's anointed. Now get the spear, water jug that are near his head, and let's go. Now when you think about that, what an opportunity David has. And in fact, previously when he encounters Saul in the cave and he gets an opportunity and he doesn't take that opportunity, this situation is different because now what's going on is Abishai, who is David's nephew, he offers to do the killing. In other words, this is a way of Abishai saying, look, David, the blood doesn't have to be on your hands. Let the blood be on my hands. And so at least if I kill Saul, you can claim innocence because you haven't lifted a hand in anger against Saul. But David's no fool. David recognizes that ultimately he is the commander of his men. So even though he's not the one lifting the spear and plunging it into Saul, he will still be guilty of the death of Saul by not preventing his servant, his nephew, from carrying out this act of violence. And as a result of that, David is able to say, no, I don't have to take matters into my own hand. I'm confident that at the right time, in God's own timing, he will ensure that Saul comes to harm. David is in fact submitting himself under the sovereignty of God and is able to say with absolute confidence, I don't need to intervene in this situation. I will wait and however long it takes God, if I have to be chased for another couple of years or months or whatever the case is, I will not take matters into my own hand. I will be patient and I will allow God to unfold and work out his purposes according to his sovereign will. What an expression of faith. Faith is patient. Faith lets God move according to God's will. Faith never rushes God. Faith doesn't say, Lord, I want you to do something and I want you to do it now. And if you don't do it now, I'm going to be upset about it. No, faith is willing to say, Lord, I would love you to intervene now. But if you choose not to intervene now, if you choose to only intervene a lot later on, I'm willing to cast myself into your hands. I'm willing to leave the matter with you. And I'm willing to allow you to work it out according to your purposes and your will. And so David exercises incredible patience. What does that remind you of? It surely reminds us of the Lord Jesus Christ, who himself exercised incredible patience. You can imagine what it must have been like for Jesus, being put on trial in front of Pilate, being sent to Herod to be plied with questions by Herod, then to be mocked and beaten by soldiers, and then to be strung up on a cross and have people laugh at him and to suffer the ignominy of being on that cross and to suffer the pain of insults and the pain of ridicule and the pain of physical suffering on that cross. When he declares that he could call on 12 legions of angels to rescue him on the cross. Jesus exercises incredible patience because he knows 
that when God moves and when God vindicates and when God finally relieves him by raising him from the dead, his vindication will be absolute and will be complete and he will have accomplished all that God has called him to accomplish. And so there's a sense in which you and I need to exercise patience in faith. We need to wait upon God. We need to allow God to move according to His timing. And His timing is so often different to our timing. But great faith is always patient. You may have experienced something in your life that has caused you a certain level of distress or heartache. Maybe it's a bad marriage Maybe it's a financial crisis. Maybe it's job-related. Maybe it's child-parent-related. Maybe it's related to a friend or some family member that you're going through. Maybe it's internal demons that are, are you struggling with in your own mind. I don't know what it is. And maybe you are crying out to God, and God is saying to you, yes, I'm aware of your situation. Yes, I know what's going on in your life. And I'm saying to you, just hang in there. Be patient, for God will bring an answer when God sovereignly determines to bring that answer. Notice also how faith expresses itself in obedience. Saul, re- I mean, Paul, uh, so, sorry, uh, David recognizes he cannot, does not have the right or the authority to kill Saul. God has anointed Saul as king. And God is the only one who has the right to determine when the reign of Saul comes to an end. So David submits himself in obedience to God, knowing that he must not take uh, this matter into his own hands. And that is also true with us as we wait. We wait obediently before God. In other words, let's say, for example... You are experiencing a bad marriage. That doesn't give you the right to go out and start an affair with someone else because things are going so bad and you're saying, Lord, but you're not doing anything. Lord, you're not answering me. Lord, you're not intervening in my situation. That doesn't mean if you've got a financial problem that you should mean use some dubious way of relieving yourself financially by engaging in some kind of fraud. Uh, in, in order to alleviate your financial situation. Rather, we bring the matter to God, we pray and we ask God to intervene and we ask God to sort it out and we let God do it according to his timing. This is the problem that Habakkuk had, didn't he? When he cried out, I will stand, chapter 2, verse 1, I will stand at my watch station Myself on the ramparts, I will look to see what he will say to me and what answer uh, uh, he will give to my complaint. In other words, Habakkuk is saying, okay, I've laid it out before God and I'm going to wait for him to answer. And then in chapter 3, when God has spoken and from verse 17 following, Habakkuk says, even though there's no grapes on the vine, even though there's no oil in the vat, even though there's no wine, even though there's no crops in the field, I will wait for God. I will trust in God in spite of what I'm not seeing at a visible level. And I will allow Him to resolve the situation according to His timing. So can I encourage you to allow your faith to be patient. Don't try and rush God. Don't try and twist God's arm. Don't become frustrated or angry when God doesn't answer according to the timetable that you've set in place, but allow God to do what he will do. Secondly, faith receives encouragement. Look at verses 13 to 16. Faith receives encouragement. Verse 13. Then David crossed over to the other side, and stood on top of the hill, some distance away. Now that's a fair distance, far enough that as you look across the valley, you're not going to necessarily recognize the person because you don't have the visibility to do that. We didn't have binoculars back then like we have today. He called out to the army and to Abner, son of Ner. Aren't you going to answer me, Abner? Abner replied, Who are you that calls to the king? 
David said, You're a man, aren't you? And who is like you in Israel? In other words, Abner is this strong, powerful soldier. Why didn't you guard your, my lord the king? Someone came to destroy your lord the king. What you have done is not good. As surely as Yahweh lives, you and your men deserve to die because you did not guard your master, Yahweh's anointed. Look around you. Where is the king's spear and water jug that were near his head? The encouragement that David receives is from the fact that God enabled him to sneak up on Saul because he put him in a deep sleep. Let's look at the end of verse 12. They were all sleeping because Yahweh had put them into a deep sleep. It is a further reminder, you see, that God encourages David to say, look, I've enabled you to have this opportunity that you won't take because it would be wrong for you to take, but I've put him to sleep. In other words, David, I am protecting you. Saul is not going to take your life. Saul is not going to put you in danger. In spite of the fact that he's heard a report and he's followed through with this re report that he's heard and he's come to the place where he's heard that you are located, you are in no danger, David. And God so moves upon Saul and his men that he puts them in such a deep sleep that none of them hear David coming, none of them where. Now, if you understand how that would have worked, the army would have circled Saul and Saul would have been right in the center. So in order to get to Saul, David would have had to move right through the army and then his most brave and fiercest men, the ones who are there as almost bodyguards, if I can put that in inverted commas, are the ones who would have been closest to Saul right in his immediate vicinity. Even they don't hear David. And so what is being highlighted is the helplessness of Saul. There is no one to protect him. Yahweh has removed his shield of protection. Yahweh is no longer watching over Saul. Yahweh has rejected him as king. Yahweh has anointed David as the future king. And because Yahweh has done all that, David is not going to lose his life to Saul. David is completely protected from Saul by Yahweh. God has a way of encouraging his servants when they are discouraged. David has been pursued from pillar to post all over Israel. Saul is relentless. Yet in the midst of this pursuing, in the midst of hiding in caves at times, in the midst of being in foreign lands, God is saying to David, hang in there, David. I'm watching over you. I'm encouraging you by reminding you that Saul is helpless to do anything against you because I have removed my shield of protection from him. God uses a variety of ways to encourage us, doesn't he? He encouraged Elijah when Elijah had no food and he brought to him the raven uh, who brought meat to Elijah so that he could eat. He encourages Saul in 1 Corinthians 12 verses 7 to 9. Well, in fact, He's been renamed Paul at that point. Now, to, uh, 1 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9. and uh, Sorry, not 12. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 7 to 9. And that's where Paul is told that the sufficiency of God, he says to Paul, even when you are weak, I'm strong because my grace is sufficient for you. Now, Paul is going through some difficult times. He has prayed three times for God to remove this particular thorn in his flesh. God says, I'm not removing it, but I'm going to give you the right amount of grace. So even in the midst of that distressing situation, Paul's encouragement comes in the form of grace. John Flavel wrote of a certain Mrs. Honeywood who was an earnest Christian who nevertheless felt that God had cast her off and that she was without saving hope. One day a minister was meeting with her and marshalling reasons against her desperate conclusions. It was then that she took a Venice glass from the table, a Venetian glass from the table, and said, Sir, I am as sure to be damned as this glass is to be broken. 
And with that, she threw it mightily to the ground. To the astonishment of both, the glass remained intact and unbroken. A small little sign that God would have said to her, I've got you covered. I've got you in hand. God knows if you're feeling discouraged. God knows if you're feeling frustrated. God knows if you're going through a difficult time. And God won't allow you to descend so much into the depths of despair that he will not bring some form of encouragement, some form of light to your eyes, some form of enabling you to keep on persevering even though times are dark. So can I encourage you that in the same way that God encouraged David by reminding him that Saul was in his hands and would not bring any danger to David in spite of the pursuit that he was engaged in, that God is able to encourage you in your situation. Whatever despair and discouragement you might be experiencing right now, God hasn't abandoned you. And God was able at the right moment to bring you some encouragement. Thirdly, faith experiences distress. It's very important for us to understand this. Faith experiences distress. Look at verses 17 to 20. Let me read those verses. Saul recognized David's voice and said, Is that your voice, David, my son? David replied, Yes, it is, my lord, the king. And he added, Why is my lord pursuing his servant? What have I done? And what is wrong that I am guilty of? Now let my lord, the king, listen to his servant's word. If the lord has incited you against me, then may he accept an offering. If I ever men have done it, may they be cursed before Yahweh. They have now driven me from my share in Yahweh's inheritance and have said, go serve other gods. Now do not let my blood fall to the ground far from the presence of Yahweh. The king of Israel has come out to look for a flea as one hunts for a partridge in the mountains. Now I want you to hear the distress there. What is the distress related to? Well, David gives us a bit of a clue there, doesn't he? Notice what he says about the worship there, when he says, um, they have now driven me from my share in the Lord's inheritance. Go serve other gods. Now, you may ask the question, hang on. Why is David talking about going and serving other gods? Well, the one thing you need to understand is that in ancient uh, times, land and God were connected. So that God's presence is connected to the land that you're in. And the presence of God is celebrated in that land at the temple or at the tent in those days because there was no temple at that stage. And there were religious festivals that occurred in the land. And so the people would gather together and corporately during those times, whether it be Passover or Rosh Hashanah uh, and, and, and uh, other festivals, they would celebrate together and worship God. Now what David is saying is that I've been driven from the land. I'm no longer to access those times of corporate worship. And I've been driven into a foreign land which is connected with other gods. And when you're part of that foreign land, you are expected to participate in the worship of those foreign gods. Now, that is not to say that, Na uh, that David did participate in that worship. It is simply a way of expressing that I'm isolated from the land. I'm away from where the worship occurs. I'm away from God's people. I'm driven from the presence of God who presences himself in the land that he has given to us. And he says that I'm missing out on that sense of togetherness in corporate worship. Now, that's so very, very important, isn't it? Because it's a reminder to you and I that the experience of David back in the Old Testament is no different from the experience of us today. Because we are told in Hebrews that we are not to neglect 
the meeting together of the believers, that we are to also corporately meet together. There is a sense in which, even though God's presence is everywhere, and God's presence is with the believer even when they're at home, there is a special sense in which God reveals his presence when we gather together corporately as a church and also for us to encourage one another in fellowship together and so that the corporate nature of worship is axiomatic to the faith of the Christian person. What I mean by that is that if you are a Christian, you will understand that corporate worship and Christianity go hand in hand. You can't separate the one from the other. If you are a Christian, then by definition, you participate in corporate worship. It is part of our DNA. It is part of who we are in Christ. No Christian can worship God only in isolation. Yes, you can worship God in isolation, but not only in isolation. It's not as if private worship is the be-all and end-all of the Christian. It's very important in the life of the Christian to worship God privately, and we should never neglect our private worship. But it is equally important that we gather together in the corporate sense to worship God. It is part and parcel of who we are. And thus, when we look forward to revelation, to one day being with God. What is one of the joys of that? Well, let me read it to you. Revelation chapter 7, verses 9 to 11. Hear this. And after this I looked, and there before me was a great multitude that no one could count, from every nation, tribe, people, and language, standing before the throne in front of the Lamb, they were wearing white robes, which is symbolizing their purity. And they were holding palm branches in their hands, symbolizing their worship. And they cried out in a loud voice, Salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. All the angels were standing around the throne, around the elders and the four living creatures. They fell down on their faces before the throne and they worshiped you get it? Do you see, here is this incredible picture of heaven one day where gathered in front of the throne, in front of the Lamb, are going to be a multitude that no one can number, made up of Christians across the world, across the generations, from the time of Adam to the time when Christ comes, from people from all kinds of different nations, different cultures, different languages, all who have been saved, all who have trusted in Christ. And there we are gathered around the throne corporately singing and praising Almighty God and the Lamb. What an incredible picture. Now, what happens here in this world, do you see, in church, is a taste, a foretaste of what is to come. So that when we gather together as God's people, what are we doing? We're gathering together as those who are united in Christ. Christ is the common bond that binds all of us together. And as a result of that, we come from different nations, different languages, different cultures. One of the beauties of the church of the Lord Jesus Christ is it's not monocultural. It's made up of a whole lot of different cultures. But what unites us together is not our culture, is not our upbringing, is not our background. What unites us together is Jesus. And so we gather together on a Sunday so that we might experience God's special presence as we worship God together as one voice, as one people. And David is saying, Oh, how I long for that. I am overwhelmed with distress because I cannot experience that anymore. I'm isolated. I'm out of the land. I can't participate in those festivals. And how I long to be with God's people. Now, the distress of David should be the distress of every Christian when we are unable to gather together and worship God together. Fourthly and finally, 
faith remains hopeful. Look at verses 21 to 24. Faith remains hopeful. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Come back, David, my son. Because you considered my preciousness today, I, uh, sorry, because you considered my life precious today, I will not try to harm you again. Surely I've acted like a fool and have erred greatly. Now, from the words of Saul, remember, this is the man pursuing David. This is his enemy. Hear what he says. Uh, after David speaks. Sorry, I'm going to go forward a bit. Then Saul said to David, May you be blessed, my son David. You will do great things and surely triumph. So David went on his way and Saul returned home. Do you see that? Here from the mouth of Saul, his arch enemy Saul is saying, I understand, I recognize that God has anointed you as king. You, David, are going to go on and do great things. And David is going to go on and do great things because God has determined it and God has called him to be the next king who will replace Saul. And thus David is going to be vindicated by God. God is going to bring the downfall of Saul. Saul is going to lose his life in battle. In fact, he's going to be mortally wounded and will eventually say to his servant, run me through, and his servant won't. And so there's a Hittite who runs him through. And eventually Saul is going to fall on the battlefield. And David is going to ascend to the throne. And even Saul knows that to be true and recognizes that. In other words, there is vindication for David in God. There is hope for David in God. God has got David's future all sorted out. And God will ensure that David's future will be realized. Nothing can prevent it from occurring. All of God's purposes, all of God's plans for David, all of them will be fulfilled in spite of of the perilous situation he is now in. And thus, you see, in the midst of the most difficult of circumstances, you and I need to look ahead with great hope, knowing that God will accomplish everything he has set out to accomplish in your life. And every plan and every purpose of God will be finally realized and you and I will not live a second longer or a second shorter in this world. And when God has accomplished all that he has determined to accomplish for us, he will take us to be with him. So faith remains hopeful. Faith may have tears running down its face, but it never ever loses hope in God. It never ever doubts God's perfect purposes. It relies on God. It trusts God. It seeks to continue to submit itself to God. And it rests in Him, come what may. And thus, my dear friend, whatever you may be experiencing, I don't know. I know there have been some difficult times people have experienced in this church. Don't ever allow that flame of hope that God has placed in the depths of your heart ever to be extinguished. Let that flame of faith grow and grow until it is a raging fire that continues to remind you that no matter what you might experience in the here and the now, no matter how bad it might get, your future is secure with God. And whatever happens in this world, even if it means the ending of your life, there is an eternity to which you will go that Jesus Christ has secured through his death and resurrection that is waiting for you. And you and I will go to be with Christ and then we will be there forever because Jesus took care of our sins on the cross and because Jesus was raised from the dead and has 
secured for us a place in heaven. So no matter if you're at the point of feeling as though you're going to break, no matter how depressed you may get, no matter how down you may get, renew your hope in God. Renew your hope in the fact that God has got your back covered. God has got your future covered. God has planned it out to its nth degree, every minute detail, and God will ensure it all happens according to his timing and according to his glory. Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. May it encourage us and may you strengthen our faith. May we not become disillusioned or disheartened to the point at which we throw up our hands in exasperation and throw away our faith, but help us to remain hopeful in you. Strengthen our faith during this time, during these days, we pray. May we grow closer to the Lord Jesus Christ and come to trust him more fully in all things. And now may the Lord continue to bless you in all things, in every way, for Jesus' sake. Amen.